Good day YouTube, Warbles on a lot here, Sunday the 25th of February, getting set up for the minefield. I don't know why, we may not be perfect, but heaven knows we try. But all around, even our old friends put us down. Let's drop the big one and see what happens. Field, a program that uh, tries to negotiate the ethical and moral dilemmas of modern life. That, of course, is Randy Hamill's political science. Let's drop the big one now. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, me, Walid Ali, and my co host Scott Stevens have kind of tried valiantly to avoid discussing the topic that we've landed with today. But uh, alas, well, we couldn't in the end. It's just so dominated the news cycle in Australia, even around the world, it's got a bit of attention. And, it actually raises some very interesting questions that are very mindful worthy questions. So it, was, it is without a sense of prurience, I think, that we delve into the topic that uh, will characterise or define today's show. Scott, would you agree with that characterisation? Thank you so much for saying that, Willie, because, yes, I mean, in many ways, the last thing that we want to talk about this morning is the Barnaby Joyce effect. Uh, but this I think, like so many really interesting topics that have consumed public conversation, this particular topic has highlighted, I think, so much of the inarticulacy, so many, so much of the in, uh, the inconsistency in the way that we think about very, very important. I love your adjective, by the way, minefield worthy. Let's hope that that <laughs> itself gets a bit of traction, maybe even a dictionary entry one of these days. Um, uh, it does attract, I think, uh, uh, some very real reflection on some very important topics that I think are central to, maybe even in some way specific to the political vocation. But in fact, one of the things we really want to interrogate in the show is just how peculiar they are. Are there, in fact, lessons uh, here that go far beyond the political vocation as such and that draw us all, I think, into the orbit? So uh, let, me just, let me just sort of lay things out this way. Um, uh, I'm, and, and you know, you've already, I think, made a very important gesture towards the moral delicacy of this topic. And if I can just echo with you, Walid, I, I really do think, and I've said this on some other kind of conversations that I've had on radio over the last couple of weeks, that I really do think that there was a tragic dimension to this entire story that's engulfed Barnaby Joyce and now the coalition government that was swept aside far too quickly and far too easily. I mean, there are uh, women who have been caught up, uh, who have been subject to, I think, immense injury and humiliation that and that consideration did not give enough people in the media i think anywhere near enough pause before they thundered headlong uh in pursuit of the newsworthy and i think as soon as there was the sniff of political blood in the water this has created i think really a rather intemperate form of reflection and public reporting without anything like the due consideration that ought to be given by the fact that whenever there is profound human weakness extraordinary stupidity and lack of good judgment there are going to be casualties and these casualties are in no way complicit in uh, the wrong that was uh, that was done or the humiliation that's going to now uh, overtake them and so i think that that you know can i just say from the outset that really should be something i think that kind of hovers above and undergirds a great deal of our of our conversation um, which is why hopefully we really don't delve into the you know prurient or the or the disgusting but i i wonder if you've noticed Waleed, the, the way that the media conversation surrounding barnaby joyce shifted i so you know the the, the news outlets that first reported it was just the titillating stuff it was just the sex that grabbed the attention and then the more principled form of uh, parts of the media and even some of joyce's political opponents wanted to make it anything other than sex this is about you know yeah <laughs> it felt like it was kind of being reverse engineered to make it uh newsworthy at a, a more highbrow level <laughs> <That's> exactly <laughs> so we can continue to talk about the gossipy bit of it that's kind of how it felt I, I, and i'm not denying there are serious 
issues that it raises um, that are worthy of news and a sort of discussion, but it kind of felt that way. Yes, absolutely right. And then those who still wanted to say that sex was part of it, but wasn't really the big, big, big part of it, and were a bit, maybe feeling a bit squeamish about moralizing about the private life of a public person, they just said, and Michael Kirby was the most recent now to, to do this, that what really stuck in the crawl was just the hypocrisy of the whole thing, that here you have someone who's a kind of family values campaigner, and this is what he goes off to do. One of the nice things, though, that happened late last week is that the entire matter, I think, was quite radically simplified in a very real way by this particular intervention from Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull. I'm not here to moralize, but we must recognize that whatever may have been acceptable or to which a blind eye was turned in the past, today, in 2018, it is not acceptable for a minister to have a sexual relationship with somebody who works for them. Mm. Um, so I love, is... I'm sorry, Walid, I love that, but <coughs> I'm not here to moralize. Now let me but, moralize. <laughs> uh, well, except the, the, the way that this has since been framed is that this is not at all a moral judgment. This is more about good work practice mm -hmm. for ministers. Um, so if we can try to sterilize it in such a way that it's it's a, it's a managerial conversation mm -hmm. rather than anything um, to do with the morality of it, then suddenly uh, we can talk about it. I, I think you and I might disagree here. I think that is possible, like in living memory, the single most stupid intervention oh my goodness, that really? could have been dreamt up in a scenario like this. I, I can't think of a more cack-handed intervention from a, a politician um, that doesn't involve an actual policy or, or something like that. It just, it, it, it is utterly ridiculous that this is the way Malcolm Turnbull responded to this, I think. I can kind of see why he did. I'm sure it played very well on social media. I think there's an element of getting swept up in the Me Too moment uh, and then formulating ministerial guidelines on the basis of that without actually thinking through what the consequences of that might be. But I, I think this is a massive mistake that he's made that completely, A, contradicted everything he'd said about this up until that point, where uh, you know, a week previously he was talking about privacy is important, this is a very difficult time for him and his family, we don't intervene in the consenting adults, a very sort of straight up and down liberal line that mm he's -hmm. suddenly just thrown to the wind. And I think that contradiction is a problem, um, at least for Malcolm Turnbull, um, and indeed for his colleagues who clearly aren't on board with this, as Julie Bishop's hedging uh, since has kind of demonstrated. But just the consequences <laughs> of this, I think, are uh, potentially horrific. But I know from speaking to you off air that you thought this was actually the single greatest intervention. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I, don't, I don't understand how you've reached that conclusion. Okay, okay. Maybe I'll let you do that and then I'll like, explain my concerns. Right, then poke holes. Well, hang on. I, I just want to hear from you first, though. Uh, yes. hang on. No, 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 no. Hang on. Uh, okay, right. you're usually in the pilot seat and usually I'm happy to be <laughs> your, your Robin in the sidecar. But, you know, look, right. just hang on for a second. Sure. Is your problem here that the Prime Minister's response was inconsistent? Or is your problem that it was belated? Is your problem that it has not a snowball's chance in hell of being efficacious? Or is your problem with the principle of the, the change to the ministerial code of conduct itself? Uh, all of the above. Wow. Yeah. That's very interesting to me. Yeah. Because I, I, would have, I would have thought the reason, look, oh, you know, I accept that this was an inconsistent response. Sure. Uh, let's just put that to one side. Indeed, because we're, in, we're in agreement on that. Okay. okay. And I also accept that it would have been much more both morally and politically credible had something like this happened, say, six months ago, when so much of the consciousness surrounding uh, power dynamics in heavily hierarchical institutions and institutional cultures was really yeah. coming to public consciousness. Okay. Uh, which is why the question of whether he knew about the affair before has become a live question. Yes. yes. I would agree with you on that, but I would still have thought it was disastrous. Okay. Here's, here's my, here's my uh, this is why I thought it was so salutary. Um, as soon as you say that in a particular type of culture, 
that is predicated on very strict forms of hierarchy and the uneven distribution of power. And I do think that that the political culture is has a particular institutional quality that needs to be given particular due. It's not just the uh, unequal distribution of power from ministers to staff, but it's also the unequal distribution of power from senior staff to junior staff. I mean, it is a heavily, heavily stratified hierarchical environment. As soon as you say in that kind of environment that this is an environment in which one can credibly and meaningfully and reasonably pursue sexual relationships, then what you are doing is you are saying that you have learned absolutely nothing from the testimony of women over the last, uh, sorry, uh, when I say you here, Willie, I'm not saying you specifically. I'm well, I don't know. Led you, you, you gun and fire as hard as you like. Right, we right. have learned absolutely nothing over the last six months about the peculiar uh, um, uh, difficulties that women face within heavily hierarchical environments in which their very survival is predicated on the extent to which they can give a sense and cultivate a sense of, let's just call it sexual availability. Now, Catherine McKinnon, I think, was absolutely right when she said that the inequality that so many women face within hierarchical work environments really is equivalent in some ways to prostitution, where you have to offer your body in exchange for survival. As soon as you say that in, in a political environment, one can reasonably pursue sexual relationships without cognizance of the attenuating uh, um, uh, uh, other factors that are involved in the un uneven distribution of power and also the, the coagulation of power around usually men still in politics, then you are creating an environment within which the very forms of sexual harassment, violence, and violation can in fact happen. What I thought the prime minister was doing, what was so important about that, is to say that in politics, the nature of politics is such where there is another virtue uh, that is peculiar to the political office that ought to constrain and that ought to rule out certain forms of sexual desire and in turn availability. I, I, I thought that was exactly the right lesson to, to, to glean from the last six months. I think I agree with everything you just said, and yet you're still wrong <laughs> because... To say this is a disastrous move or a disastrous thing to do is not to say that the concerns that it is attempting to address are not real or legitimate. Mm -hmm. It's not to say that there isn't a power imbalance and that that does raise problems for sexual relationships in those contexts. I, I would not be opposed, for example, to an overarching ethos that this is a bad thing to do. Like, I think that would be a fair uh, position to take. What I think is disastrous is turning that into a ministerial code of conduct mm. that presumably is policeable and punishable. And I think there are re two, two main reasons for that. One is it is impossible to police. I don't see how you enforce something like this. And I note that when Scott Morrison was questioned about that on Inside of the Weekend, he said, no, but it's, it, if you effectively said it's prophylactic, um, it, this will prevent people from doing this because they know if they do it, they're they're out of a job. Yeah. Um, but which Emmanuel the Cat, by the way, the, that's exactly, well, I mean, Emmanuel Kant has a, had exactly the most perfect philosophical argument against that. If you say to someone, you go into the brothel, you have your fun, but on the other side of the brothel is waiting the guillotine, that would in no way dissuade a vast well, majority of that is going in. It could only dissuade if it was policeable. And since this doesn't seem policeable, um, I, I don't see how it has that effect. But it, it, except it is policeable in one way, and that is via media. Yeah. And so what Malcolm Turnbull has done, I think, is reconfigure political coverage in this country henceforth. Wow. How can you ex explain to me how you could possibly argue against any chief of staff, any newspaper editor, any website editor, any television chief of staff or, or producer who now assigns one of their senior journalists to a sex beat. Mm -hmm. How can you possibly argue against long-range telephoto lenses looking through <coughs> um, you know, hotel rooms and people's houses? Because there is now no argument any longer that this is not in the public interest. It's officially in the public interest from the mouth of the Prime Minister. 
the Prime Minister has said this is a matter of public and political consequence. It is now utterly relevant to everything and everyone and to every voter. And therefore, if you assign all of your journalistic resources to trying to police affairs that are going on in Canberra, you are now doing the Prime Minister's work. You are doing the calling of high office. Now, some people might say, well, good. But what I say is think about the knock-on effect of what that means for the culture of our political coverage, for the culture of our political conversation, um, for the recalibration of our public and civic space and the issues that predominate within it. And that's why I think, notwithstanding, that I do understand the claims of um, the person who is political and, and that sort of stuff. I do understand the way in which the public-private sphere can uh, erect institutions uh, and barriers that perpetuate power imbalances, and so I understand that. But I nonetheless think that the public-private distinction remains... Okay, we're on the upload limit. Back immediately.